for the rest of us. We're going to be taking a look this morning in uh, the Gospel of John. We started last week opening up a, a new book, a new uh, letter here in the uh, book in the in the Bible here, written by the Apostle John, as he recounted and, and told the story in his older years of, of what happened, what it was that he saw when he saw Jesus Christ of Nazareth enter into our world and, and engage it, embrace it, die for it, rise for it, and lead us towards new life in it. And so if you are uh, looking in your bulletin or you can follow along in your Bible or on your phone, as we read from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, starting in verse 19. And this is the testimony of John, that is John the Baptist, a different John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they have been sent from the Pharisees. And they asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Join me in prayer. God, as we come to look in this text, 
God, as we come to hear the voice uh, of our brother John who lived so long ago, so long ago that his, his words and his rhetoric, his, his, the rhythm of the story that he tells can feel weird and disjointed to our ears. And yet, Lord, you gave him a voice that he might speak your truth to us this morning. Lord God, you have preserved his words that by your spirit you might bring out life in us. And so, God, you are the one who promised that your word does not return void. And so we pray this morning that your spirit would do that work to take your words, cement them to our heart, and lead us forth into new life, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, uh, a couple years ago, Whitney and I were um, going to, to get away for a few days up uh, to Chicago. We were leaving the kids with our parents up in, in central Illinois, and we were going to go back to, uh, to our first city that we were married in. Our, our first little apartment was there in downtown of the city of Chicago, and and so we were anxiously awaiting this day, and I prepared for my trip to Chicago like uh, many of you have. I was just speaking with one of you this week. And, and you begin Chicago planning by planning out your restaurants that you want to go to, right? You go to a, a city of, of a little more size than Memphis, and you can find all sorts of, of different varieties and, and different chefs and and different things, but but my thing is not the the fancy restaurants. I don't I don't care about the the celebrity uh, chefs. What I care about is pizza. Okay, pizza. And and a few years ago, now uh, my doctor gave me some very depressing news when he said that that I could no longer eat gluten, that I could no longer have flour, and and the pizza that I have been relegated to since that day has. Um, not lived up to the beauty of a beautiful Chicago deep dish pizza. You, if you've been to Chicago, I, I hope you know the beauty of which I, I speak, right? This is the, the, the pizza pie that's, that's multiple inches thick, that's layered with, with cheese and, and bread and the sauce that sits on top with crushed tomatoes. It's a, it's a glory to behold, and I found one place in the city of Chicago, a place where some beloved, uh, I got to imagine, saint of God, had developed a gluten-free, deep-dish Chicago pizza. And so we arranged a, a whole day around it because it was not anywhere close to any of the other things we were doing. And and I go to this, this pizza restaurant, and it's a bizarre hour of the day, and so we're the only ones in the restaurant. It's like 3 in the afternoon or something. And we go, and we sit down, and, and uh, the, the waiter comes, and he asks, you know, do you know what you want? And I was like, I, I don't even need to look at the menu, okay? I want the, the stuffed, gluten-free, deep-dish pizza, which... Um, I have to give you a little more background. In Chicago, there is a battle over what's the true pizza, whether it's stuffed with two layers of crust or whether it's just one layer of crust and exceptionally thick. Um, and and uh, some people think that the stuffed has too much bread, uh, but they're wrong. Um, the stuffed is the preeminent Chicago-style pizza. And so when I had the chance, and it was on the menu, and I could not wait for it, and, and, and he looked at me, and, and he kind of had this, like, kind of like a grimace on his face. He's like, you might, have you had that before? And I was, like, immediately on the defensive, right? I was like, no, that's why I'm here. I got to try it, right? I've been waiting to try this. He goes, you know, honestly, the, the, the stuffed gluten-free pizzas, it's not that good. You, you probably don't want to order that, right? You probably don't want it to go there, and, and every bone in my body is feeling this grimace and this pain of like, no, but I do. I do. I want to taste it. He said, it's too much bread, and I said, I love bread. Give it all to me, right? 
Have you ever had a, a, a waiter do that? You go to order something and, and uh, maybe it wasn't something you looked forward to as much as I look forward to that pizza. And, and they say, no, that's, that's not really what you want. Maybe I'm just a combative person. But when somebody tells me that's not what I want, what is it I immediately think? No, that's who are you to tell me what I want my pizza to be like, right? Who are you to, to adjust my order? Who are you to shift what it is that I want in life? As we come uh, to this gospel of John, um, in, in, in many ways it's, it comes to us almost like a, a, a waiter telling us what we want. We talked about last week how, how this book of John, and John says, I have, have written this that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing you might have life in his name. And we talked about how, how John's presentation of Jesus leads some into a tragedy because they, 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 they do not see it. They do not believe it. They don't believe that really Jesus is the path to the life that they were made for. That Jesus is really the hope that they need. But John starts with that audacious claim and he's going to continue raveling now telling you what it is that brings you life, telling you what it is, the means and the manner and the person who can bring you the kind of fulfillment and the kind of belonging and the kind of, well, full life that you desire. And so as we get dive in today, we're finding this message, this message that Jesus is the only way to experience the fullness of of life, and we find this message beginning to ram its head into a real world and a, with uh, historical people who interacted with a, a real man who walked on the ground and who spoke with them and, and engaged them. And what we see in this opening chapter and what we'll continue to see throughout the book is that the historical Jesus always creates problems for the people he's in relationship with. He always creates a disturbance. He always challenges their conception of what it is that we want. And it's all couched in this language of, of a Messiah, the hope for, the, the anointed one, the one who would be the king to end all kings, the one who would bring freedom and rest and the kind of life that the people wanted. But first, we're going to look this morning at how Jesus is not the Messiah that the people in this text think they need. He's not the kind of Messiah. He's not the person that they expected. It's not the kind of Messiah that they necessarily want. And I think if we look at this, we'll see that maybe we're not so different from them. As you read this this account, it's a, it's a combination of these stories, right? These little uh, train, uh, train cars put together that tell us this story of Jesus' entrance into the world. And one of the things that we notice uh, in each and every one of these stories is, is just kind of how uh, Jesus kind of gets the, the slight, he kind of gets the, the cold shoulder. You see it right from the beginning, right in the beginning, you, you see this man, John the Baptist, a uh, distant cousin of Jesus's who's about the same age. And this 30-ish John the Baptist is surrounded by a crowd of people, people who had come out to the desert seeking him, seeking to know what it was that he said, seeking to understand it, seeking to receive baptism by it. We see that the, the leaders of Jerusalem have have been sent out to come and to inquire because they get the gist that maybe this guy, maybe he has something to say. Maybe he is part of this Messiah project. Maybe he himself is the Messiah. What we notice is that there's also a 30-year-old Jesus. A Jesus who has walked on earth the same amount of time as John, and yet he's presented in this text like uh, a, a man cutting through the crowd without fanfare, without notice. 
without disciples trailing behind him, asking him questions. No one is there to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? Are you the prophet? Who are you? Jesus goes unnoticed. John the Baptist has the, 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 cart, the curtain. He has the stage. He has the microphone. Jesus is so completely unnoticed. You notice John the Baptist, one day he says, hey, look, everyone, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Son of God, right? Like, you would think that's, you know, that's a pretty substantial thing to say about somebody, right? If I said that about Josh here, right? Uh, we, you know, you would probably take a mental image of what he looked like. You might go follow up, see, try and ask some questions about it. But the, the way the text almost presents it, it's almost comical. The next day, it said, John's disciples, who almost assuredly would have been there the first time that John had said this, they're like, John, uh, Jesus comes by again the next day, and, and his disciples were like, wait, was that the guy you were talking about? No, wait, what? What were you saying about him? He so was underneath their radar of their expectations or their thoughts that it it took two times for John the Baptist to say, this is the Son of God before anyone started to pay attention, anyone wanted to follow after. Then we come to Nathaniel, right? And Nathaniel, when he hears about Jesus and he hears where he's from, right? Nathaniel's the only one we get to hear what's going on in his brain, and what's going on in his brain isn't real pretty, is it? Jesus from Nazareth? Wait, you're you're saying that this guy is is the Messiah, the promised one of Israel, and he's from Nazareth? No, 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 no. That can't be, right? This can't be the case. Jesus comes and he enters into the world and he has been proclaimed and anointed at his baptism. The Spirit of God has descended upon him and every human that seems to be around him uh, at their first look at least goes, hmm? Who's that? What's going on? You see, the problem isn't that they didn't have a category, that they weren't didn't desire a messiah you know the people that start to get a hint that you hear it in every section of this people are asking are you the christ are you the one who's going to save us are you the one who's going to reverse our fortunes are you the one who's going to bring life and vitality to the the nation of israel they wanted a messiah it ran deep in their bones and the longing of their personhoods the problem is is that they're quite confident that jesus wasn't the guy that they needed I don't know why. I don't know why it was so easy to neglect. I don't know why it was so easy to ignore even uh, at the strongest of declarations of not just his messiahhood, but his divinity. But I think if we look at this text, you probably can have some some, uh, interesting uh, suggestions, interesting insights, right? The very courtship of John is fascinating. John uh, in the Bible is, is told to us that he is kind of a, a wacko character, right? He's, he's out in the desert wearing uh, camel hair and eating locusts and honey, right? He's, he's the kind of guy that is not normally a power center, but he is a guy who has uh, attracted a crowd. He's attracted people. And the Pharisees, the Pharisees in particular, it's noted, are the ones who take notice of this man who, who is preaching a strong religious message. A strong religious message that had resonated with people and he had amassed a crowd of people. The Pharisees are looking for somebody that has some political weight to them, right? Maybe John the Baptist, if they could hear him out, he would be on their side. Because you see, Pharisees were locked into this existential battle of of the identity of of who Israel was. They were warring with uh, the Sadducees in terms of who the identity of the people of Israel were going to be. How they were going to interact with their oppressors in Rome, right? The kind of Messiah that the Pharisees long for, it surely seems that they were hunting down people that had influence, people who they thought might 
agree with them, people who might be politically useful, who reassure them of their superiority, who resolve their problems. Nathaniel, his slight on Nazareth, right? He seems to, to hear a message, a, a declaration that this man from Nazareth is a Messiah, and that does not jive with the kind of Messiah that he pictures in his brain, right? A tiny little no-name town from Galilee isn't supposed to be one where power is held. A tiny little town in in Galilee, quite different from the Nazareth of today, was obscure and unknown. It was the, the powerful elite did not reside there, nor did they visit there. Nathaniel's slight on Nazareth is, is unlikely to be a, a racial one or, or something along these lines. It's likely to be kind of the economic of power ones. Who was this? He can't possibly be the Messiah. I don't really know what it was that they thought they needed, but it surely seems like Jesus didn't fit whatever the bill was. I think if we're to listen throughout this Gospel of John, we have to recognize that, that Jesus often is that for us too. Now, you're, you're at church, right? You're, you're, you're folks who have gathered here together. Maybe you're a believer, maybe you're not, right? But it's, it's quite common and it's quite easy to say oh Jesus is the Messiah that we want and yet as we read this gospel and as we interact with the way that he brings life into people's um, well life into people's lives the way he does so uh, will always create problems for us too maybe not problems of, of great philosophical weight but my uh, assumption is, is that you're like me. Your Christian life, your Christian experience, your, uh, the way it fits in with the rest of your world is, is that you have negotiated in your brain some sort of, of truce with the Holy Spirit, or so you think. The, the, there's the things that Jesus says and the things that Jesus teaches and the things that Jesus represents that fit right with what you think and the way you want to be in the world, and, and so you like and appreciate those things. Then there's the parts about Jesus that, that confront and conflict, the kinds of things that seem unattainable, the kinds of things that seem ridiculous, the kinds of things that seem like death, the things that, that challenge what you think at a gut level is good for you. You see, you are like me and you experience what seems to be an insatiable appetite for all variety of things, right? For sex, for comfort, for security, for hope. And Jesus can, uh, in many readings of the story, come into the hearts and lives of religious people like me where, where I've kind of figured out the things that I don't feel guilty about anymore. And he tends to put his finger right on those things, doesn't he? It's kind of like the, the cosmic joy kill, the expectations, the rules, the life change that he expects from people. And so gee, we, like the people in Israel, can be quite confident that Jesus, he's not the way to live our fullest life. He's an accent. He's a supporting cast. He, he brings and resolves a few things for us. But when push comes to shove, right, my desire to be safe can only be fulfilled by feeding it, regardless of what Jesus has to say about welcoming the outsider into your home. Jesus, as we interact with, with, with people, we see him say these things like, pick up your cross and, and follow me. We see a man marked by poverty, hardship, oppression. And we're people who are tired, people who are worn out. We're people who, who are 100% sure we have enough on our plates, right? Right? And so when we have a Jesus that comes into this text and he says, come and follow me in these things, that goes, God, I've, 
I've, re I've reached my threshold already. I've done enough. Maybe that part of Jesus, that kind of life, isn't really life. What I need is to be uh, comfortable and safe. Maybe it's Jesus that, that surprises you and makes you uncomfortable with his universal uh, and, and open arms towards the, the sinner. His open arms towards the outcast. His open arms towards the, the, the sick, the leper, the lame, the outcast of societies. And you think, I just need to, to, to not be in to much in touch with that. I just I need a moderation, right, God? Not that. Maybe it's the exclusive claim of Christ. Reading a book of the Bible where, where Jesus will tell us that I am the way, the truth, the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And in every sense, we've already gotten that jive already that Jesus says that he is the only way towards life. And, and to some of us here this morning, that seems uh, intellectually a stretch. Could he really be that kind of God? Could he really be that kind of power? Is there really one way to life? To others of us, it will strike us, that claim will strike us as, as morally repugnant. How dare you tell others where life is? What works for me is not what works for someone else. And yet, this is the way towards life that Jesus tells us. And in many ways, he is like I would imagine he was to these first people on one hand, just too pedestrian, too normal. Christianity is, is the, the manner of life, the religion of norms. It's the cultural waters that we swim in. And so we can easily look at Christianity and say, been there, tried that. That's not what brings me fulfillment in life. That's not what brings me truth. We're quite certain that we know what brings us fullness of life. We just think we can't quite pull all of the things we, we have going on together, right? If I could get just the right mixture of Jesus and just the right mixture of, of money and just the right mixture of, of sex or acceptance or, or power, then I would have the fullness of life. But it's fool's gold we're after. When I was a, uh, a, a high schooler, um, I was still holding on to the dream that I could be a, a basketball player, but I had a few problems in that I was uh, slow, weak, couldn't jump, couldn't dribble, and couldn't shoot, right? Um, and so my, my dad had, uh, thought, well, hey, maybe I'll get him a couple lessons with kind of the local guy who was renowned for his shooting form, right? He, he, his kid played D, D1 and was a, you know, that spot-up shooter on the three-point wing, and, and he was known for his ability to help guys learn their form. And so I, I go to a few lessons with this guy, and he's, he's pushing me and prodding me and, and yelling at me in all sorts of ways. No, bend your knees more. No, keep your back straight. No, move your arm this way. No, move your arm that way. And, and it felt weird and uncomfortable and awkward. And I was like, Dad, I don't want to go back. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And my dad, uh, uh, <laughs> my dad was like, he doesn't know what he's talking about, huh? He's the problem, right? He's the one who's bringing something that's discomfort to you. And so you're saying, no, 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 that's not the way for me. I imagine if I sat down for coffee with each one of you, and if you sat down with coffee for me, I could give you a whole list of ways, changes, things that I could do better, things that the world could do better for me, things that my, my wife or my kids, my parents, right? My, uh, 
the, the ways that the elders could fix my life and make it better and make me live a more full and joyful and satisfied life. And yet I think many of us don't even know what that life is. Many of us have all sorts of ideas of how to fix our life, uh, and yet if we really looked at the ways our success rates, we would look at our lives and be like, we don't even know what full life means. And so what I think this passage does for us is it brings us this question of how confident we are in what brings us fullness. It challenges our assumptions and our certainty of what brings life to us because I think the problem is is that more often or not, consciously or unconsciously, we reject the kind of life that Jesus offers us because we think we have a better idea ourselves. And I think what Jesus invites us to do is to, to doubt our doubts to doubt the kind of life that we think brings life and encourage us that there is a different kind of life, a different kind of invitation. And so I briefly want to take a look at these words, these words you heard it in both of the last two stories where Jesus says um, to John's disciples, come and see. And later Andrew Uh, will say it to Nathaniel, and he will say, come and see. It's a fascinating phrase in a whole number of ways because, you see, Jesus could have taken offense that these people uh, were estranged to him. Jesus could have, have been like, weren't you listening when John the Baptist told you who I was? When, when his, uh, John's disciples come to Jesus, they say, Rabbi, uh, where are you staying? Not, Rabbi, we, we heard that you are the source of life and we want you. Not, Rabbi, you are the only way that can bring us hope and salvation. Not, Rabbi, teach us what you know. Rabbi, where are you staying? I'm kind of curious, but I'm not sure about whether what you are saying is life is really life. And Jesus' words to them were, come and see. Late in the afternoon. Come and see was an invitation to come stay the night where I'm staying. Come sit at a table uh, with me. Come and see is to come and spend time looking and seeing if this life was really true. At the very source of it, it's an invitation from Jesus to these men who had their doubts to come and have their doubts with him. We use the word doubts, and in our brains, we kind of tend to think of like, oh, uh, doubt means like an intellectual, I'm not sure if Jesus uh, exists, I'm not sure if there's a higher power, I'm not sure if there's something outside of the material world. And and I think those uh, are all the kinds of doubts that fit in what Jesus is, is willing to engage with these folks with. But I think there's a different kind of doubt that's far more prevalent in your life and my life, and it's very simply sin. You see, when, when I respond in anger and yell at my wife, what's going on inside of my heart is that I think I have to win. It's better to wrong than to be wronged. And when I act on that anger and when I yell with my mouth, when I do harm to her, wor- to her life, what I am consciously living out in my life is a disbelief that Jesus is the way towards real, true life. When I look at the needs of, of our city and our world and I want to, to pull myself back and hide in my room and find comfort and find the kinds of, of, of media that will take me out and abstract me from the pain and suffering in the world, I am consciously doubting whether God's life of engagement and loving of the neighbor is really good. That's the doubt that we live in our lives, the doubt we live on an hour by hour, day by day, more often than not level, is what God says good. Does it bring me life? 
And so if you're here this morning and you have doubts, whether they be the intellectual kind or whether they be the gut level, heart level doubts of whether Jesus is really the kind of life, is he's really the kind of Messiah that you need, then you need to hear his voice as he says, come and see. Come explore, come test, put, come, put, come, put, uh, put eyes on what life is. Come put ears on what truth is. Come put hands and feet to the work of what I say is life and see, is it true? Because to come and see is to come put our doubts to the test. Come put our our unfaithfulness to the test and see what is really good. When Nathaniel said, can anything good come from Nazareth, he was uh, a small window into his world, a small window into the way he processed life in the world, and it was extremely human-centric, right? How could anything of significance come from a place of insignificance? Right? How could there be a Messiah from a town of no repute? And Jesus comes and he interacts with Nathaniel in, in three different lines. And each one of them he is challenging and unraveling and asking him, you've come, you've sat with me, now let's take a look. Jesus says, here's an Israelite of, um, I can't even remember the words. Here's an Israelite. Indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Before Philip called you and you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Jesus all of a sudden is taking his materialistic, humanistic centered world and he's saying, There is a truth that you do not understand where I can know you even though you don't feel like you've been seen. Jesus to come and to sit with Jesus, to come and see with Jesus is, is for God. Jesus to challenge our doubts, to challenge what it is we think brings us life, that he could fill it with something else. Nathaniel uh, responds to this this, uh, show of strength by Jesus, and he says, (laughs) he says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. But it's fascinating that Jesus' response is that Jesus says to him, uh, you believe in me just because of that? You believe in me just because I I messed up your worldview, because I promised, uh, I showed you that there was something that you didn't understand? He says, no, 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 no. Your doubts may be being uh, doubted. You're, You're closer to the truth than what you were, but what you don't understand is that there is far, far more in life with me than you can see. Jesus is far more than the magician. He's far more than the magic show. He's far more than the 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 cheap trick. Jesus says to him, I am the ladder that connects heaven to earth. It's an Old Testament story, but but here's the hunch of it. Here's the crux of it. Jesus is saying to him, if you are with me, you will see heaven and earth brought together. The, The world that you think is lived on a human realm will be shattered as God resides with man and man with God. It is the fullness, it is the fullest fullness that you can imagine, Nathaniel. To the doubter, to the one who who thought little of Jesus and thought little of what Jesus could be, Jesus takes his doubts and he flips them on their head and he gives him an expectation of a fullness of life he could never dream of. As we sit here this morning and as we reflect on what our life is, when we think of of what it is that our bodies will crave or are craving this minute, as we think about the decisions that we'll make about life and where we'll spend our time and where we'll spend our energy, the the problems that seem too big for us to confront and and Jesus' insistence that we confront them and they feel really hard. It feels like death. It feels like that can't possibly be the way to life. 
But I think what Jesus says to Nathaniel, when he says, you ain't seen nothing yet. You haven't seen any of the fullness of the fullest life yet, the life that is to be found in me. We live in a pattern of chronic doubt that Jesus is really the life giver. This belief that Jesus could really be the Messiah that we need, but Jesus bids us come and see, come and sit, come and stay. Put me to the test and see if I'm not good. Pray with me. Father, we pray this morning that you would continue to unravel our conceptions of what is good in life. That you would unravel our, our spirits of, of pride, our, our spirits of impulsiveness, our spirits uh, that want to satisfy and gratify uh, the, the very tainted and broken picture of life that we have. And Lord, you welcome us to come as sinners. You welcome us to come as doubters. You welcome us to come into your presence and put it to the test and see if you are not good. If the things that we fear do not bring us life and wholeness in you. Father, we won't come by ourselves. So call us, beckon us, grab a hold of our hearts and our minds and our bodies that we might find you and be found by you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.